Um, welcome to the Select Hall panel. Uh, my name is Wesley Goatley. I'm a, an artist and doctoral researcher in critical data aesthetics. I live in London. I voted Remain, just in case anybody wants to ask me that. Um, the panel today uh, is uh, looks brilliant. I'm really, really pleased to be uh, getting the opportunity to moderate it. Thanks to um, everyone at Theorizing the Web for inviting us all here and putting us on. Uh, I'm going to in uh, introduce everybody as we go, so you'll have an opportunity to um, hear about people's individual bios and research as they talk. Um, first up is Krista. Krista Schnell is a PhD student in sociology at UC Berkeley. Her research interests include gender and technology, not surprisingly because she studied mechanical engineering in undergrad and then worked for five years as a technology consultant in Silicon Valley. She believes that we critique what we love. All right, super excited to be here today. Um, so, I'm gonna start off with a uh, short story, actually. Um, so, as I was, my introduction, um, I'm a PhD student in sociology, but um, before this, I was an engineer and a technology consultant. Um, by the way, this is a true story. Um, so, when, um, I had, um, I love data, that's the point. I love data, and basically one Valentine's Day, I decided to attend a meetup on it, which was a terrible idea. Um, as you can imagine, uh, networking, which is already like pretty awkward, was super awkward, so I just decided I was gonna talk to my best friend, not worry about things, and a guy came over, and without any other introduction, looked at us, said, so how big is your data? At which point I looked at my friend, we were both kind of confused, turned back, and I said, it's pretty big. Uh, so we can learn a couple of lessons from this story. Uh, the first is that's a terrible pickup line. The, uh, the second is that there seem to be some undertones between masculinity and big data. And the third is that I totally played along. I was way more competitive and less dismissive of that of that comment than I would like to admit. Um, because at the time, I actually totally believed in the superiority of big data. I figured if you weren't working with it, then you were probably intimidated or not smart enough, honestly. Um, and just for so that everyone knows I'm talking about big data, it's imagine data that's very large and complex and to easily be dealt with with traditional software. So. A couple years later, which was a year and a half ago, now I went to my first sociology conference. And I was like, why would anyone do interviews? I don't get it. Um, especially when there's like big data technologies. Um, and I was actually in that very moment that I realized the way that I thought about qualitative methods and interviewing was kind of like small and weak and like, kind of like I thought about femininity, actually. And on the other hand, quantitative methods being more superior and more valid and actually kind of like I think about masculinity. So it turns out that I'm actually not the first person to have ever thought this. Um, Anne Oakley is a sociologist and a feminist scholar and she wrote this article about gender, methods, and people's ways of knowing. Uh, totally destroyed my soul <laughs> in that moment, but in an amazing way. And she points to a history in which qualitative methods have been aligned to the feminine and quantitative to the masculine. And importantly, this idea of gendered methodologies is socially constructed. So how did this happen? Well, we come from a long history in which men have been considered the subjects or the knowers, and women are seen as objects or nature and to be known. And scientists wanted to calculate the universe and predict and control in an objective and a value-free way. But I wonder, is this even possible? Um, feminist scholars would indicate uh, no, and they challenged quantitative methods and argued instead for qualitative methods to kind of get at this. But at the time of Anne Oakley's article, Big Data didn't exist, so I was thinking, oh, well, you know, if big data could be kind of seen like the pinnacle of quantitative methods, then perhaps it would also be kind of the most masculine um, if we go along with this socially constructed idea. Um, and if that's the case, 
maybe it actually makes sense my why more women wouldn't work in big data beyond sort of the pipeline and the work culture problems that we so that we hear about today. Um, maybe there's more to it, and perhaps I could figure that out by talking to big data experts in Silicon Valley. So I chose a qualitative feminist qualitative feminist uh, interviewing method uh, to highlight and convince myself of its strengths. So this meant in-depth, face-to-face interviews um, where I minimized the power differential between me as a researcher and my respondents. And typically these feminist interviews are listen for the quote-unquote muted voice of marginalized people. Uh, I know in this case I was interviewing people of a pretty relatively privileged uh, class, but I actively sought to listen to what I believe all of us have in us as some sort of muted voice, even if that contradicted some of my hypotheses. Um, so now the question that many of you may have, which if you are would actually kind of serve to prove my hypothesis is, how many interviews did I do? Um, and I actually went back and forth on this a lot because I, I doubt myself and I was like, oh, is it like not enough? It's too small. Uh, would a man share this info? Would he even think about this question? Um, yeah, do I, like, why am I even asking this? So, the point is, the struggle is real. Um, and I did eight. So, yeah, so I did eight interviews with um, big data experts in Silicon Valley, three women, five men. Um, the qualitative data that I gathered from each of them was rich and deep and nuanced, and I did detailed analyses of each. Um, a part of me knows that I have something important that I want to share, and another part just kind of wants to like curl up in a ball and uh, feel like, you know, is that enough? It's too small, it's too weak, too biased. I'm, I'm still in this old way of thinking. Um, and there is a lot that I would do to improve upon, upon my study. And um, the point here is that I think you should critique and question what I did, but in the same way that you would critique or question any quantitative or big data project. Um, because according to the data, I don't think that's done enough. So here's what I found, and I'll be putting quotes up on the screen that you can read. Um, first, big data um, as a term is often used as a mass noun referring to a homogeneous aggregate. And this can be problematic, one, because men in our society tend to be uh, more easily quantifiable, so they'll have salary jobs, for example, whereas women, if they tend to stay at the home, that's, that's a lot harder to quantify, and they can be, start to become invisible in aggregate. Um, there's also a metaphor of big data as a natural resource to be harnessed and exploited for value, and again, given that historical context, which I referred to previously, um, where men are kind of the knowers and, and women are, are more like nature and objects, then this can also be uh, discouraging for women in the space. And uh, if you're not convinced, I'm actually just gonna take a moment, throw myself under the bus. Um, I wrote this article titled The Data Supply Chain back when I was a technology consultant. So we know that there's this data ideology and preference in our society for quantitative methods and more objective research. And I actually just bolded this whole quote because I feel like uh, it really encapsulates, in many ways, although not all, a positivist mindset uh, that data doesn't lie. Very objective, right? Um, also, there's this idea of qualitative interviews. Um, they're too small, too weak. Uh, implying that bigger is better. And also, I'll just note 200 interviews <laughs> feels like a lot. <laughs> um, and feminists argue that all of this is in service of gaining power to know and dominate. Traditionally, again, men over women, uh, subjects over objects. And in today's world, this could be thought of as control to model, predict, and understand consumer behavior to potentially change it um, so again, no wonder that women might not feel welcome in the space of data. Um, before we get too depressed, uh, there are some nuances, or what I like to think of as these muted voices. Um, the term big data is actually seen as somewhat nebulous. There's no one objective understanding 
or singular truth, which is actually in line with a lot of feminist values. There is uncertainty when making bold claims. Back to our favorite quote, I just feel like data doesn't lie. Um, and there's also this idea that big data, uh, th there's bad data, it's hostile, you distrust. And these reveal hints of uncertainty that are against positivist, positivist preferences. And uh, finally, a quote that was just uh, music to my ears at this point. Um, Certain attributes of the landscape are probably better captured by the qualitative and some by the quantitative. A good designer or researcher can ideally toggle between both. So in summary, what have we learned? Well, I used a qualitative interviewing method to get at something that I think would have been very hard to capture with numbers alone. Uh, we have the term big data is problematic because it is a homogeneous mass to be harnessed and exploited for value. We live in a data-driven culture in which we preference positivism and believe in objectivity, where more data provides better knowledge and more power. However, we also at the same time have these nuanced themes, uh, nebulous data, uncertainty in terms of feelings, and um, bad data that betray positivism and finally, we have some mixed methods fans out there. So the purpose is not to hear for me, is not to reify traditional ways of thinking. Um, rather, I wanna call attention to these gendered methodologies as a social construct so that way me, we may attempt to shatter it altogether. Because currently I do believe that there is a connection between our data ideology, the way we talk and think about data, and an underrepresentation of women in high tech. Um, you can kind of just look at that picture. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, so to truly fix this gender problem, I argue that we need to extend our efforts beyond recruiting women into tech and hiring and maintaining them. I think that these are problems and we, that we definitely need to address them as well. But we also need to all actively rethink the ways that we speak about and understand big data, because as it currently stands, I think we are exclu excluding and marginalizing women from this space. At least, I know I was. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um, our next speaker is Lindsay Weinberg. Lindsay's a fourth year PhD candidate in the History of Consciousness Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her dissertation argues that information technologies are part of a transformation in how capitalism produces value. She's interested in the relationship between commercial forms of surveillance, temporality, and discourses concerning pos possessive individualism and privacy. Can you guys hear me okay? Is that good? Okay, cool. Um, thank you all so much for coming and thanks to Theorizing the Web for having me here today. Uh, so my paper is called Rethinking Privacy, A Feminist Approach to Privacy Rights After Snowden. On February 16th, 2016, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, released a message to Apple customers regarding a court order to provide the FBI with access to one of the San Bernardino shooter's iPhones. Cook describes the FBI's demand as the following. Quote, specifically, the FBI wants us to make a new version of the iPhone operating system, circumventing several important security features, and install it on an iPhone recovered during the investigation. In the wrong hands, this software, which does not exist today, would have the potential to unlock any iPhone in someone's physical possession. The FBI may use different words to describe this tool, but make no mistake, Building a version of the iOS that bypasses security in this way would undeniably create a backdoor. And while the government may argue that its use would be limited to this case, there is no way to guarantee such control. Unbridled government access to personal cell phones certainly raises concerns over privacy. But what is particularly interesting about Cook's letter is the way it posits Apple as a guarantor of such privacy. 
The digital economy, which includes the goods and services that Apple provides, is predicated on the observation of user behavior to market goods, services, and advertisements. Tech corporations are thus able to deploy the discourse of privacy rights, a discourse that was reignited by privacy rights activists following Edward Snowden's revelations, to defend their data against government abuse, and yet simultaneously continue the collection of consumer data for the purposes of economic exploitation. In the context of this corporate appropriation of the struggle against surveillance through privacy rights discourse, the relationship between surveillance and privacy warrants rethinking. Rather than arguing that government and corporate surveillance encroaches on the private sphere, I argue that divisions between the private and public are structured by the spatial organization of capital. Privacy rights discourse, indebted to the liberal democratic tradition, reinforces the dichotomy between public and private life and also the fiction of the sovereign subject, a subject that, quote, answers only to its own internal order and is not accountable to a larger community, save only to the extent that it has consented to do so. And that's from Biederman's International Law Frameworks. Following feminist political theory's critique of the public-private divide and the fiction of the sovereign subject, I argue that the focus in a critical analysis of the digital economy should not be on the ways commercial surveillance has come to encroach upon an otherwise isolated private sphere, but rather on the points in the circulation of capital where subjects are individuated or individuated for the purposes of profit accumulation and control. So let me explain those terms really quick. I define individuation as a construction of the consuming, desiring, and individual subject, and individuation following Deleuze as a process whereby subjects are treated as an anonymized and aggregated mass and are thus non-sovereign. While the private sphere in traditional liberal democratic theory is presented as separate and opposed to the public sphere, feminist theories have demonstrated their interrelatedness. The slogan, the personal is political, is often cited as an example of the challenge to the division between public and private life, given the ways the private sphere is structured by decisions made in the public sphere, often to the detriment of women. As Diane Cooley explains in the context of a global communications network that merges public and private life, spaces are increasingly mobile and connected, and thus destabilize a clear boundary between the public and private. Cool argues that, quote, while the, while the response of some critics, feminists among them, has been to reach for a liberal language of negative liberty, privacy, and protective rights, these would seem to have only marginal relevance to the sort of processes mentioned here, end quote. An understanding of the public-private distinction in the digital economy needs to adequately address the ways that conceptions of the private and public have been transformed by technology, including commercial surveillance, that extends monitoring throughout social life. As Izzy Papa Teresi explains, quote, the information about decision-making behaviors that occurs in the private realm increasingly becomes a tradable commodity, end quote. This information, assembled by private data brokers, is marketed and sold to both private and state entities. What current privacy rights frameworks struggle to account for, given this emphasis on individual rights-based claims, is the process of individuation, the mass data collection that allows for prediction and guidance of subjects' behaviors and choices, on which the digital economy is largely predicated. Target advertising, for instance, uses data analytics to determine which users are most likely to provide a return on capitalist investment, presenting particular options and choices to certain users, while those determined to be risky investments do not receive the same rates, discounts, or ads. As another example, the rewards of cost saving and fast shipping are contingent upon the hyper-tailorization of fulfillment center labor and made possible by aggregate consumer and worker data. Furthermore, in many cases, privacy legislation has been used to expand the scope of capitalist surveillance rather than impose limits. For instance, the Video Protection Privacy Act of 1988 became the foundation for Netflix's push in 2011 to amend the VPPA's consent provision so that companies could obtain a one-time consent from consumers, allowing Netflix and other platforms like Facebook to use the association of users with various commodities and services to create targeted ad campaigns. While Colin J. Bennett contends that, quote, realistically, without privacy regimes, there will be few, if any, actual mechanisms of social redress for public and private wrongs, and sometimes the policy regimes do have positive results, end quote, 
privacy regimes centered on rights and contractual relations between individuals and corporations also help corporations to modify their terms of service in order to further legitimate data accumulation as mutually agreed upon and transparent. Perhaps most significantly, in anonymizing the data, corporations can argue they uphold the legal protections afforded to users in regards to individual privacy and concerns over overt discrimination. If, as I have argued, discourses about privacy rights are tethered to the idea of the sovereign self, and if this tethering has provided loopholes that can be exploited by corporate interests, how do we rethink privacy to account for the individual? Feminist theory has been one of the most generative sites for theories of the non-sovereign relational subject. Carol Pateman explains that contracts are premised on exemplifying and securing individual freedom, but on the contrary, quote, in contract theory, Universal freedom is always a hypothesis, a story, a political fiction. Contract always generates political right in the forms of relations of domination and subordination, end quote. While the non-political status of familial and private life conceals the contractual relationship of marriage that produces the family, the privacy rights framework conceals the non-sovereignty of online users who are governed through the commercialized capacity to distill patterns in aggregate data. And in the same way that workers must agree through the contract to be subordinate to their employer, privacy rights puts the subject in the position of either agreeing to be monitored or to not participate in digital culture. Eva Feder Kitty proposes in her book Love's Labor that rather than focusing on the properties that make people individuals, we could formulate an equality based on mutual relations of care and concern, end quote. A transformative politics for Kitty is premised on the inevitability of human interdependence. Perhaps then, the individual is symptomatic of the underlying sociality underpinning the digital economy, where the dependency and vulnerability of some subjects is co-produced along the incentives and rewards of others. The contractual nature of consumers and platforms, where consumers freely agree to the terms of service of platform providers, conceals these social relations of power. While industry insiders emphasize the importance of individual, personal web experiences, generating a conception of the self as unitary, as non-relational, and rationally predictable through its perpetual celebration of individual consumers' needs, the underpinning process of individuation reveals a relational subject who can be fragmented into data. What then might a transformative politics look like concerning the digital economy if the traditional categories of public and private are no longer tenable distinctions or put in the service of the extraction of profit for the few. As I have argued, the recognition of the non-sovereignty of the subject stresses relationality between subjects, the contingencies between subjects and that one person's data, extracted through leisure time surveillance, could be used to intensify the workplace domination of another, or the ways that allow for prediction, preemption, and management of the options and choices of others. It is this awareness of these collective conditions of individuation that then empowers subjects to act collectively against these conditions of exploitation and surveillance in the digital economy, rather than treating privacy as a matter of individual rights. At minimum, the current private economization of data that results in the unequal distribution of market choices, the flexible and precarious labor market, and the consolidation of power, information, and wealth in the hands of the few could be socialized, the repurposing of social wealth extracted from corporations that exploit user data for social uses. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, next speaker is Jack. Jack Khan is an independent writer currently based in Brooklyn, New York. His research interests include contemporary art, the history of medicine, political theory, disability studies, critical race theory, and American studies. His work has been featured by the New Inquiry, Disc Magazine, the LARB, and the List Art Center at MIT. Thanks, Jack. Firstly, I would like to thank my fellow panelists and all of you for showing up today. I'm also grateful to Lindsay for putting, like, introducing so much vocabulary around control societies. That's going to help me out a lot for my presentation. Um, the topic, by the way, of my presentation regards missing, spelled M-S-S-N-G, um, and how it and other open science projects are changing what it means to be disabled. Um, the big takeaway that I want you to have is that while new tools for organizing information might seem democratic or sexy, 
um, we don't use those tools, if we don't use those tools to ask the right questions, we invite some pretty undemocratic and unsexy outcomes. Open science seems like a great way of promoting freer and more accessible um, scientific research, but if we do nothing to examine our dominant assumptions about science and human difference, we're doing nothing to actually address inaccessibility or inequity. Yes, open pro science projects like Missing do make genomic research more available, but they've done very little to change the fundamental assumptions within Western science that create inequality. Um, but let me start at the beginning. Missing is a partnership between Autism Speaks and Google, and it became the biggest archive of genetic information, uh, an archive of genetic information about autism ever. Um, in December 2014, it released this really cinematic promotional video that I'm gonna show you, um, just so that you can get a gist of how Missing's communication department might describe its own mission. Um, I don't know how to get the, the um, great, oh. uh, excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. The unknown. Vast. Unexplored. A place of hidden potential and great discovery. Alone, we can't grasp it. Together, we will master it. It is in the hope for answers that we keep pushing on to change lives because we took that journey. This is DNA. The beauty that nature gave us, making everyone a work of wonder. The missing answers to autism can be found in DNA. Exploring it will change the future of this disorder, uncovering different subtypes for personalized treatment. Because what we know so far is not enough. Autism Speaks presents Missing an open source research platform for autism. We will collect the DNA of 10,000 families affected by autism, creating the world's largest database, letting scientists from around the world analyze it, study it, and find the missing answers. Your donations will bring this project to life, and together we can conquer the unknown. So there's so much in that video already. <laughs> did, did, I'm sure you noticed a lot of the colonialist rhetoric that they used, like this notion of like the sublime, natural, unknown body, or like even just their abundant use of seas or oceans of information um, to describe some sort of like information that will help us know about ourselves that we do not know yet. Um, so. Yeah, these are some foundational Western colonial metaphors, like boarding a ship to go somewhere unknown where the subject can gain knowledge of themselves by studying what they do not yet know. So already without digging even very deep, um, we find lots and lots of problems, just at least like with the framing of missing itself. Um, uh, I'm just going to move now onto a quotation uh, from an interview with Stephen Scherer, who's the program director at Missing. Uh, he said, quote, I am immensely excited because for the first time, any scientists anywhere in the world will be able to collaborate and perform analyses with these data in a common cloud, thanks to Google Cloud Platform and our work with the Google Genomics team. This vast sea of information will be made accessible for free to researchers everywhere. So again, this is the nautical metaphor. Um, this is an exemplar for a future when open access genomics will lead to personalized treatments for many developmental and medical disorders. Okay, I'm just gonna repeat that last sentence for you because I think it's pretty important. Um, this is an exemplar for a future when open science genomics will lead to personalized treatments for many developmental and medical disorders. Um, so 
this is the moment in which the missing program director tells us how he imagines his own project will create change over time. Open access genomics promises to bring us into a future in which, quote, developmental and medical disorders are treated in personalized ways, an approach to neurodevelopmental distance that was difference that was previously impossible. He's saying that uh, he thinks open genomics will bring an end to normalized medicine as the dominant approach to autism treatment. So currently, autistics are diagnosed using a series of tests intended to measure the AQ, or autism quotient, of an individual based on her behaviors, cognitive abilities, and certain comorbidities. They, they have knowledge of their medical history, things like that. Um, in other words, psychometric and behavioral tests measure autism by comparing individuals to developmental norms over time. Missing is different than this completely. Missing um, is part of this new uh, genes first approach um, in which uh, autism would be diagnosed by just giving, giving children a genetic test even before they're born. Um, so why is this important? Basically, Scherer envisions that by collecting this massive glut of genetic data, it's really a lot of data, um, the scientific community can finally pinpoint the complex genetic contingencies that supposedly cause neurodevelopmental difference. Missing's goal is to address a presumed problem at its presumed source. Um, of course, genetic research about autism has been conducted already for decades, but it hasn't really been that useful to people um, or organizations like Autism Speaks that are trying to find the holy grail of contemporary neuroscience, the autism cure. Why? The scientific community has been waiting and waiting until it's feasible to store the entire genome of thousands and thousands of people. By the way, just so that you get a sense of the scale, um, storage of an entire human genome requires about 100 to 200 gigabytes. So missing could easily surpass a petabyte of data. This is, um, it's like huge. This fund, uh, this funds to support the massive amount of data storage could, I think, be used in ways that are more directly actionable or ways that actually affect or address inequality in the days of disabled people. Um, but this serves a certain ideological purpose much better and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more. Um, so scaling back a tiny bit, why is it necessary to collect this much data? Um, because we aren't talking about the kind of Mendelian genetics you might have learned about in high school. Um, the genetics of autism is much more complex than just a Punnett square. Um, many, 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 many different genes are involved in things like language or fine motor development. So to develop a gene's first understanding of autism, what would need to sift through giant data sets looking for patterns as subtle as, say, global climate trends? So we, our bodies are super duper complicated and, and trying to understand the body's movement, its development over time is really, really complicated. Um, so with this increased capacity for storage, the nature of autistic difference is redefined. Um, but the notion of aut autism as a pathology is reaffirmed. What was once presumed to be a spectrum developmental disease, and before that a psychogenic disease, is now presumed to be a genetic disease. This is because while the means for diagnosing, measuring, and defining autism have been in constant revision since the term was introduced, the underlying assumptions we have about autism research continues to dominate. And I'm gonna tell you what that assumption is. Um, for example, one thing that psychoanalysis, occupational therapy, and open genomic autism research have in common is that all of these methodologies are designed to search for the moment when a normal child becomes an autistic child. This goal becomes to treat the the goal becomes to treat the autistic child to recover the normalcy that was pres that they presumably lost. I also think it's important. It's always about the child. No, there's never really a lot of research or discussion. It's a taboo adult autism, really. Um, so, in psychoanalysis, uh, the discipline that actually first coined the term autism, it was defined as the result of of parental trauma. This is the refrigerator mother hypothesis. Um, observation was recorded by an expert, the analyst, and they were supposed to use their analytic methodology to uncover the traumatic moment that caused their patient to become autistic. The patient 
is um, compared to norms of child psychic development and treated to recover those norms. In an occupational therapy setting, what's kind of more dominant right now, autism is defined as a cognitive difference. Observation and psychometric testing is used to plot a patient's capacities on a continuous spectrum from low functioning to high functioning and then treated accordingly. The patient is compared to norms of cognitive and behavioral development and then treated to recover those norms. In open genomics, autism is defined as a genetic difference. Genetic observation is used to plot various genetic subtypes to come up with a more granular model of human difference. It's not so continuous because it's not about necessarily comparing someone to a norm, but about describing the specific uh, genetic qualities that someone has. Um, uh, basically, if Missing's uh, project proves successful, it might be possible then to edit the genes that cause autism or supposedly cause autism in order to um, sanitize the human species from autistic difference altogether, or at least from the populations with enough privilege to access these treatments. Therefore, we see in the history of the treatment of autism a trend of moving closer and closer toward data-driven approaches in an effort to capture the complexity, complexity of the supposed pathology of autism according to whatever methodologies were big at the time. However, I think what sets the genomic approach to autism apart is the implicit promise that it can not only help the, quote, abnormal autistic child develop their normacy, but also it can improve the norm itself. Um, one promise of open genomic projects like Missing is that by uncovering the heterogeneous subtypes of autistic difference, researchers can isolate genes associated with, uh, with pathology from those associated with greatness, such as musical talent, et cetera. Um, and I worry about these impl scientific implications and the political implications of this new 21st century reboot of 20th and 19th century eugenics. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, next up, and our last speaker is Tante. Tante is a political computer scientist and independent researcher working on better understanding, analyzing, and communicating the relationship of automation and people. He's written for German and US publications about algorithms and their social impact. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Tante. I'm going to talk about data and algorithms today. I'm going to wait till you have your snapshot. Um, first, a warning. I'm German, as my accent gives away, so I apologize for all the horrible things I'm going to do to the English language by accident. Um, and also, a quick content warning. There's a reference to algorithmic systems acting in a racist way in this talk, so be prepared for that. <coughs> but there's no picture. It's just a reference to it. Um, Tech criticism is all the rage these days. People uh, write these things basically on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. You can read a new one every three minutes. Um, and these things go through certain kinds of fashions uh, that, that we've seen in the last few years. Uh, first, uh, it was a lot about, about data. Uh, Google has too much data about you. Facebook has too much data about you. Whoever has data has too much of it. Um, it was about this idea of the, the iceberg of data. You realize that Google has some data about you, but when you really dive into it, you see there's this whole bunch of data that you never thought was there that they use for all kinds of, sh of shit. Um, the argument was mostly uh, an argument of quantity, and that came from the idea that data is power. If you have data about an entity, you have power over that entity, or at least the capability to use power over that entity. Um, so the argument was basically about quantity to, to kind of shorten that, uh, that argument in a way. Um, and that changed in the last few years, po possibly five to 10 years. Um, these days we talk about algorithms. It's always about the algorithm, whatever that means. And we're not talking about algorithms like I did when I studied computer science. So we're not talking about bubble sort or whether Tim sort is even better. It is mostly, but um, we're talking about um, a different kind of algorithm. When we talk about Facebook newsfeed, we're not really talking about what kind of code Facebook runs because we don't know. Um, we're talking about perceived mechanisms. We're looking at these systems that do something and we're trying to understand what they do, try to criti uh, criticize what they do, but we don't really have anything 
to base that on, except for how these systems operate, what they do. We see a Facebook newsfeed algorithm or a Google search acting in a certain way, but la di da, we don't know what it really means. So um, this separation or, or this development that we've seen, first looking at data and quantities of data, and these days just looking at how algorithms work and framing it in these terms, data and algorithms, is very problematic, I believe. So, uh, being the bullshit artist that I am, I came up with a new term, um, data algorithm dualism, and I define that as the belief that algorithms and the data structures they operate on are two separate and distinct aspects of digital systems that can be meaningfully analyzed and criticized separately. I'm not a fan of that. I wrote it, but it's bullshit. Um, because it's all connected in a very, very, very meaningful way. And um, we should talk about this by example, I think. So always bring in some examples and gifts to a presentation about the internet just to get some street cred. So this is a very traditional data set that I artisanally crafted on my laptop. Um, this is how, how you would represent data about people for the longest time. You have like a table of things and every column is an attribute of the people you're talking about and you have like names, first names, every, every row which represents an entity has, a uh, has an ID so you can reference it. Uh, here we have birthdays, we have sex, uh, we have references to the friends of that entity by the numbers that are given in the first column and the interests that people have which is basically monkeys and cats because that's everything relevant in this world as we all know. Um, this is a very traditional way, this is basically still how most traditional uh, database management systems work. You have tables and you put data in it. This is more than just a way you represent data. This implies a certain way to use it. Because if you have this table, you know what, if you use Excel or similar tools, this allows you to filter these things and sort these things and quickly look for all people that are considered female by, by this data set who are born after 1986, for example. Um, those are the thing, things that are implied here. Um, so a data structure comes with an assumption of how it's going to be used. You can obviously represent the same data in a different way, in a more maybe modern way. Uh, today we're usually talking about graphs. Um, this is basically the same data without some of the, of the birthdays attached to the, the entities. We have the people sitting around there and we have the interests they have, monkeys and cats, uh, and the, the big arrows point to what people are interested in and the other connections are people connected to one another. Um, this is a different way of representing the same data, the same information, so to speak, but this representation leads to very different types of analyses. If you look at this, you're looking at clusters. For example, you see the three people on the right are forming a circle. They're connected and they might be friends, they might be family, whatever kind of data you use to derive what that means. Um, you don't really think about filters if you look at data like this. You don't think about uh, how you can sort these entities. They are not sorted in that way. So this is the, the new way that we're looking at data. Obviously, uh, you can trans translate these things. Um, I did that. I mean, I created both these representations. But translating is a very conscious decision. I decide to take this tabular data and turn it into a graph to do something very special. If I just have the data and look at it, I probably will not do that if I just see what the data tells me to do with it. Um, data structures also manifest and codify bias. It's sadly that the font on the Mac is a little different. Um, the data structure, we'll, we'll go back to the very simple way we looked at before. This has a bunch of assumptions about the world in it that are very problematic. I'm just going to point out two, but you can probably find about ten. Um, first assumption that uh, basically every programmer, uh, is a trap that every programmer falls into, the assumption is that people have a first name and a name. Many people don't. Um, many people have completely different structures of name or, or the idea of name and first name doesn't exist in their culture. Another thing is we have sex and it's F or M here, female or male, which is bullshit as I don't have to explain to anyone here that that is the, the whole uh, possibility. You could also see that here you imply that friendship could be one-sided because uh, one person could be friends with another person, but that person not with that first person, which is also an assumption that might be right, but it is an assumption that the data comes with. Um, 
Um, another thing that you could translate when we're talking about data and algorithms, and they don't just come with assumptions, you can also change things around. Things don't just have to be in data. On the left example, you see uh, the sex is coded in data, it's materialized. People are F or M. You could just as easily say, I have like this little snippet of code that takes all the data I have about a person and just calculates whether they are female or male. Um, so suddenly I don't store whether people are that, maybe I'm not allowed to, but I still kind of have it. But I have it in my code, which is a completely different beast given to how many people think about data and algorithms as separate entities. Uh, and today we have another big problem. Uh, it says Avon came machine learning or automated statistics, which it's really. Um, today, a lot of the things we do are based on machine learning, um, which is basically saying you have a bunch of data and wherever you got that from, um, and you train it into a computer system, teach it to detect the patterns in the data you found, and basically just reproduce the, pat the patterns that it learned. You give it a bunch of pictures of cats, and at some point it might detect reasonably well pictures of cats. Um, and then you can apply that to new pictures of potentially cats and see if they are of the cat variety. Um, the problem with these trained systems is, is that even as an expert, you can't really tell what they do and why they work. You have just a bunch of weird data and it detects cats and pictures. But why the little, the little weight one or two or six in this blob of data code mishmash really leads to being a cat, nobody knows. It's just, that's not how they work. That makes it even harder to analyze these systems that we interact with. And the idea of having data and, and algorithm, what is that? What is the trained neural network that can detect cat pictures? Is it data? Is it an algorithm? It's not really either one of them in a reasonable way to, to uh, detect things. So let's talk about Google Photos, and this is where the racist example comes to, uh, to play. Um, Google Photos is a photo storing so, uh, service. It synchronizes the photos from your phone up to the cloud so you don't have to make your own backups. Um, these are mine, for example. I have cat pictures, lots of them. <laughs> and my favorite cat shirt. Um, so Google Photos has really good tagging. I, I tag none of that. And Google Photos detects that those are cats, which is really impressive. It also is really good with detecting desserts. Um, <laughs> And in tw 2015, there was the so-called gorilla accident when Google Photos um, tagged uh, photos of people of color with gorilla, which is so deeply offensive that I lack the words to describe what that is. Um, and so in order to criticize these things, we can't just talk about um, the algorithm, which is just a neural network, which is super simple as a, as a technology, but as applied to a data set is problematic. And the, the data set that Google Photos worked on obviously wasn't, didn't include people of color or they would have realized, they would have trained it to detect people of color as people. Thanks. Um, so we have a data set that includes uh, assumptions of the, the entity. Google is a very white company. They probably just didn't have pictures of, many pictures of black people. So they just trained it on white people and it's encoded in this blob of data and algorithms. And there's a little bit more. Um, Algorithms tend to hunt, hunt in packs. We talk about the Facebook algorithm, the Google algorithm, but they're not one algorithm. Even if you say a Google search, you have so many algorithms that, that uh, score the different posts in different ways and that the scores are merged and then sorted. And it's like, it's a very complex network of algorithms that work together. So putting it all together, select all is the topic of this, um, of this panel. Um, I think if we want to talk about algorithmic systems that we interact with, we need to not just illustrate why I should never be a graphics designer, but um, <laughs> these are certain things that we have to look at. We have to look at which input systems uh, interlock with the algorithmic system we're looking at. We have to look at what is the base, base data structure that this thing operates on. Is it, is it graphs? Is it tables? Whatever it is, cat pictures. Um, and what is the base data and who chose that? And it's always about who did that, who defined the data structure, who chose the data that the system is based on, who built the algorithm itself and who calibrated it in the case of, of machine learning systems and who defined the output data structure. In this example, I get a table. Maybe that is bullshit. Maybe I want a graph, but the system decides I just get a table and who defines that. And another thing we have to look at that we often forget is how does the user really relate to that thing? How, what does the user interpret when he gets the result from the algorithmic system? Does he believe it's 
Uh, do they believe it's truth? Do they believe it's just random data? How do they really put themselves in context to the result the system gives them? So um, I think we should criticize algorithms better. And I think to do that, we need to look at all of it and not pretend like data and algorithms are two things we can look at separately. That's basically the gist of it. Um, thanks for attention. Uh, I'm Tante mostly everywhere. Um, so get in touch. Thank you. Wow, thanks everyone. Those are great, great presentations. Um, I'm just going to abuse the position to just ask a question first. Um, given given that there is um, the title of this uh, panel and of the subject that we've all been talking about, you've all been talking about, I would sort of feel like I'm remiss if I don't mention Donna Haraway at this point, and um, uh, because I think a lot of what we were talking about is deconstructing a, an objective scientific view of the, you know, the God's eye view that fucks the world and thinking about how many different ways we have to approach this thing called data and pull at that at its subjectivity rather than its assumed objectivity. And I think that was gestured, what I was about to ask actually was just pulled out by you very nicely at the end here where you show like a kind of a, a graph of how you would be breaking down that objectivity and thinking about this thing from a kind of a situated knowledge perspective. And I wonder if, if you all can speak a little bit about the processes you've had to come to that point of challenging that objectivity, you know, what your techniques have been towards that, or what kind of w were the unlocking points for you in your own personal research? <laughs> All right, sure, why not? Um, this is awkward. Um, so, oh, thanks. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think I, I kind of alluded to this in, in, in my presentation that it's still something that I struggle with. Like, I, I, I constantly am like, oh, not like, how can I, how can I make this a quantifiable thing? And um, when it's not always so easy to do, um, I, I guess just to maybe make it a little more tangible. I mean, one of the things that obviously I use interviewing, but I think what would be really complimentary to at least the study I did is actually to do a quantitative um, analysis of maybe of how people talk about big data like on Twitter like I think that we can combine these two methods in in pretty complementary ways um, I also really liked that last presentation and and now I'm totally gonna think about um, yeah the the ways that they're the way that we look at data is you know very structured I law like code as as a new sort of law um, I think it's a very interesting concept and um, one that I think we just, we need to pay more attention and critique. Um, yeah. <laughs> thanks. yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so Donna Haraway, Situated Knowledges, for me was one of those texts that really got me thinking a lot more critically about science in general as a discipline. Um, for my work specifically, Bill Davido's concept of digital redlining and Oscar Gandy's panoptic sort to really help you think through how risk analysis is calculated and the way like proxies for race and proxies for class can be smuggled into data sets without explicitly using those terms. Um, so location data, for instance, if we know that most places are organized based on segregation, if you use location data but you're not explicitly targeting black communities in those terms, you're able to still engage in discriminatory practices without explicitly doing such. Um, so that those texts were for me pretty transformative in thinking about the ways like risk analysis and all these kinds of technologies of distributing the options that consumers get are predicated on these really racist logics. Yeah, I think um, in terms of Donna Haraway's work, the her work on situated the notion of situated knowledge is really important to me. But I think the thing that inspired my presentation the most of Donna Haraway, if I had to pick something, is this is the chart that she has in the Cyborg Manifesto, the essay from, I think it was in the 80s. Um, there's this chart and it's like comparing um, psychoanalysis and schizoanalysis and then like just there's just all this stuff on one one side which is about normalization like the types of things that we might like kind of normally associate with like a F Foucauldian view of the world about the norm and the discipline and then on this other side she's kind of talking about like granularity, like the continuum versus the granule or like the individual versus the individual, right? So the, this opposition I think is really interesting to me or like the, the ways in which this is or isn't maybe that much of a big transition or departure. Um, but then from in terms of situated knowledges, um, I just think 
uh, it's important to consider uh, the situated knowledges of a particular form of difference, like a disability or something, um, by, privile by pri privileging the situated knowledges produced by the, the subjects actually implicated by that identity, like actually autistic people versus um, the uh, these large institutions that like aren't really interested that much in actually serving uh, communities, but just kind of in promoting a certain kind of ideology. Um, I, I don't have the luck of knowing any soci sociology because I'm just an, an IT person. So I stumbled on it basically by accident by by working with data because that's what I did all day and realizing that I'm in computer science and many scientific uh, areas, there's this, uh, this, this very important phrase, the map isn't the, the territory. The model of the thing you're describing isn't the thing you're describing. Um, and at some point I realized that we were building a lot of models and especially in computer science, there's a lot of the belief that the models, because we can build models for everything, we know everything and better than everything because data and data is truth. Um, and I realized that I was forming data by coming into contact with people who I couldn't describe in the models I built. I built models like everyone else was building models around me and they were wrong for obvious reasons because I couldn't put my friends in there. So obviously something wasn't right even though everyone else says, no, that's how we do it. Uh, and that was the point where I kind of fell into the rabbit hole and just uh, tried to cobble together as much about sociology as I could get my hands on to kind of understand why things were wrong. Well, I'm going to sleep well tonight knowing that I orchestrated a situation where a bunch of people got on stage to talk about data and went, oh yeah, situated knowledge is super important. We should all be reading it. So that's good. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, you're up to touch on the mic. Um, so I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Jack. Jack. Um, hi. Um, hi, I'm Martin Stick, and you were talking about um, a eugenicist effort to kind of wipe people like me off the planet um, without any content notes, and that was highly traumatic to go through. So could you like not do that ever again and consider the harm that you're doing? Uh, you also only discuss autism speaks in the mildest terms, like the very mildest terms possible, and it would be completely possible for people to walk away from that talk and think, oh yeah, like maybe the methods are wrong, but like people are going in there with the right ideas, and yeah, maybe we should be trying to sort this disease out. And autism speaks are an organisation which have put out videos which are very sympathetic towards people who have autistic children killing their autistic children. They're very spend the vast majority of their budgets on research to find us before we are born so we can be aborted. That's what this research is going towards. This is not a benign effort and like you very closely at the end mentioned that it was heading towards a eugenicist effort. You need to be much stronger here. And you kind of like, in your critique of the mechanisms, you engage very much with um, lots of feminists for, as we said, situating knowledge. But your own practice of examining those methods and examining what goes on seems to have completely failed to engage with feminist and disability theory in itself. Your methodology seems to be built on, I'm coming at this from a standpoint of an academic outside of these systems. and. Autistic people, feminists, have been dismissing these systems very loudly, and autist Autism Speaks as its own. And there's lots of writing on there, and you haven't cited any of it. Um, could you do better? Thanks. Thank you. I, I, I agree that um, there should have been a content warning. I think that was there, that deserves an apology. Um, in terms of uh, citational practice, uh, this I feel like this is such a brief kind of um, setting. I would have loved to have extended more time to cite all, all the people, including Donna Haraway, um, Mel Baggs, um, uh, countless people. There's also a really great new book by Anne McGuire that I recommend um, called War on Autism, which is sort of about this problem of how violent autism speaks is. Um, and. I, I really, I, I agree with you. I find Autism Speaks' project to be completely despicable. Um, 
uh, the the most sh uh, sharpest and most um, condemning language about it is necessary. Um, I I sh I guess you you are correct in that I should have been more uh, harsh in my language on it. Um, I think what I was interested in today was sort of just trying to really, really lay bare some of the um, mechanisms, as you said. Um, and it's such a short period of time. I, I, I really, really want to. The, there's better ways, I guess, of incorporating everything. Um, I thank you so much for bringing up your concerns. Um, I I listen to them and I take them to heart, and I appreciate your commentary. Thank you. You okay to shout? Yeah, I can shout. Sorry. Um, so mine is about the last presentation uh, on the data algorithm dualism. So you said that we don't really know how this stuff, how data and algorithms work together because we don't have access to everything that someone working at Google or Facebook would. But I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about how changes work in those companies understand the relationship between algorithms and data, if at all. Um, or if they don't completely understand what's going on with them. Um, of course, I can't speak for everyone who works at Google or Facebook or whatever, but um, I think what is largely un ununderstood um, in, the, in the IT world is the bias that data brings towards the development of algorithms. These IT people have this tendency to just think about everything in the abstract and yeah, it's just, it's, uh, I have this bucket of algorithms that I know that I can apply and I have this bucket of data and somehow I can kind of make them fit together. But there's very little towards really um, analyzing how their internal bias forms their decisions. Um, what obviously happens is that if you have something like Facebook, which is very much, very much uh, invested in the idea of, of the graph of people, for example, um, they just think about people as graphs. That is something that, that happens a lot, that they can only think in terms of these graph representation of people and things. And you see that whenever Facebook talks about communities and how they understand these things, it's always this graph that I showed, just bigger and with a little more, more circles in there and more structures they can find. But that's their only way of understanding the world. Um, and that shows a lot in their even in their PR speak and in their, their messages, even when, when Zuckerberg goes on his I'm going to be president soon speech. That's basically the graph uh, thing turned into a political statement. Um, but apart from that, I think that's really not the point because they're not looking, they're not really looking so much at what they're doing because they move forward and bring us to the future. Or maybe it's for anybody who wants to take it up. But I think there's certain metaphors that are used with big data that it's a, a resource to be exploited, etc. Um, I like Maciej Siglowski's uh, alternative, which is that it's toxic waste and that we should be treating it in the same way that we treat waste products. And um, I, I guess this is all leading to a question of what should be done given this power imbalance of those who are like creating the algorithms and creating the data and housing it and treating it in ways that we have no control over? What do we do? I don't know. Maybe it's a lot for talk to. I don't know. Anyway. Who wants to solve this problem? Oh, gosh. I mean, the thing that you made me think of is just like the data centers, like explicit, like from an environmental standpoint, when you said in terms of how much waste is produced. Um, that being said, there's probably things that data can be useful for. Um, so for me, I think thinking of ways to socialize this, thinking of ways to make knowledge and information something that everyone has collective ownership. I know that kind of can sound romantic, but I think there are ways that there's abilities to make claims on either the profits of data and to redistribute those so that we have social programs in this country. That would be one one means um, that wouldn't necessarily control for how the data is being instrumentalized, but at least then there's some kind of economic solution. Um, so I definitely don't have the answers, um, that's for sure. But that's something that you made me think of. That metaphor actually made me think of the literal uh, environmental waste that's part of this process. So I appreciate your question. Any other thoughts? Um, I can say something real quick. Um, I was just thinking about one of the, um, the article that I mentioned about um, like 
gender and methods and people's way of knowing. And I, I know one of the things that she spoke to was, uh, and Oakley spoke to was, you know, uh, we, we uh, uh, qualitative analyses, quantitative analyses, and how we can use that, what, even these quantitative analyses, like for feminist, uh, with feminist goals in mind, so that it doesn't always have to be that, you know, data is terrible. So I, I don't, I don't know necessarily the ways that we could do that, but can I, I can imagine there might be some projects that we could with, with sort of like goals of other people or more marginalized voices in mind that we could actually maybe make some progress. Um, but thinking about these things, it, it, it is really hard to convey. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons that I switched from being in tech to um, sociology, but it doesn't get the respect uh, that it deserves quite yet. So taking on as a personal mission of mine. <laughs> um, being a communist myself, I totally agree with you. We should just socialize all that kind of stuff. But um, <laughs> putting on my reasonable hat, I have one somewhere. Um, I, a reasonable hat. I, uh, um, I think there are a few things that we need to... <laughs> We can't. I, I I like Massier. He's he's really funny. He's really spot on. But I think the idea of p calling big data just toxic waste is a little unfair and a little contraproductive in a way. Um, I think big data and the technology behind it and the ideas of generating co uh, not not causalities but correlations from it can be helpful towards defi towards finding causalities because sometimes. Uh, the data you look at, you find a correlation, and the correlation isn't the truth, but the correlation points you in a way to find a truth that might be useful. Um, so I think big data can do a lot, but the way it's used today, which is we just have data, and the truth is in the data, and we just correlate the hell out of it, and then we're going to know what's up. That is a big problem. And if we use it like that, it needs to go. But if we use it in a way that it informs, for example, model building, if it includes interdisciplinary uh, approaches, where not just some computer dude hacks together some stuff, but if it includes, for example, sociologists, psychologists, whoever, pol uh, politicians even, if, if we need that, um, to, form, to form an idea of what actually happens here, uh, then I think it is still a very useful tool and not toxic waste. What ha is very problematic is obviously if the algorithms working on it are undefined, the data they work on is undefined, and the cal calibration of the algorithm is undefined, which is basically the whole open source versus closed source argument again. I think the, uh, a system like, like Google couldn't really open up their whole search algorithm. If they do, they're dead. Not, not economically, but the search algorithm is just spam from then on. The same for faith, Facebook. If they say how their newsfeed exactly works, it's just going to be spam for you all day. Um, so I, I get that there is actually value in keeping certain things hidden, but I also think that as subjects of these things, we have a right to at least get ideas of how certain decisions were made. What went into this? Why do you believe that this is the case? And many of these tests, if you run these tests, this 10-point questionnaire will tell you if you're a man or a female, or th and they are often really bad, but that's the, the level that many of these automated algorithms work on. That's the, the intellectual rigidity, rigidity that they imply. It's, yeah, you're a female now, that, that happened. Or you're, you're 60 now, congratulations. Um, we need to see that, the, the, how the machine made these decisions, what went into it, uh, make that decision explicit so we can correct it, say, you believe I'm 60, I'm really not. Just so we can find the correct representation, representation that we think is suitable for us. Um, a suggestion maybe um, to do with, I think, mostly Leslie's work, but also maybe some things that Krista mentioned, that um, I think the work of feminist activists who are addressing online harassment in different communities around the world are actually part of this project of trying to rethink privacy um, because of what is considered private to somebody changes uh, the minute it gets violated. It's not just this this notion that you know I have uh, some really important information which you know some corporation is sucking up. Um, the context in which online harassment happens to different people uh, changes that definition of what is considered private and what is considered public, and the transactions that uh, happen online or in different sorts of spaces. So I think that. There's, I mean, I wish that there was actually more work 
unpacking what's going on in those communities. And I mean, I work as part of that community. I work for an organization called Tactical Tech, and we're part of a global network of people who are trying to say um, there are very different practices around security and privacy that have nothing to do with the sort of corporate um, sort of discursive construction of how we're supposed to be private and public. And a lot of surveillance studies also doesn't take that in. However, feminist surveillance work, I think, does kind of acknowledge that and how people of color, of different genders, have been consistently surveilled. And so the practices that you need for things like privacy have to be completely different. So I just wanted to throw that into the discussion. Thanks. Does anyone like to respond? Yeah, thank you so much. And if there's like a particular text that you think I should be reading, I would love a recommendation. I guess just to to maybe clarify or to maybe think with you about this, I my argument is, isn't that concept that privacy isn't a useful concept. Far from it. I mean, we've seen it really be a way of making claims on the state. Max Schrems had a really successful case of overturning Safe Harbor. So it's not that I don't think privacy has a utility as a concept or that it can't be a really important idea in terms of a feminist struggle in terms of these kinds of violations when the information that is at stake is very much so a private one. It is something that you feel like you don't want disclosed. It is very much related to your personal identity or the things that you don't want kind of seen by others. I think for me, what I was interested in trying to figure out is what happens when that information is anonymized? What happens when it's not information that has any uniquely identifiable traits? It's information that is created in an aggregate mass and it's usually assigned a number and it's not so much related to an interiority that's being violated but the way that corporations can kind of create prediction and preemption based on kind of those huge large swaths of data. Um, so I guess I was trying to make a distinction between when is privacy a useful tactic and then how do we account for the fact that there's also this use of data that's really not tethered to an individual subject but it's actually tethered to this to this mass and that's why I think Deleuze is useful in that sense because he is trying to think through um, what is new about the, t the technologies and the kinds of subjects it's able to produce and it's the fact that we can be fragmented and aggregated and then privacy I think no longer has the same conceptual weight or tactical weight for that particular context which isn't to say that it's not useful in some cases I guess to clarify. I'm just also going to throw in um, uh, Catherine D'Ignazio's and other people's um, feminist data visualization as well into that mix, which is like a brilliant and, and very fresh kind of project. That there's a lot of um, recent work coming out around that. Any other questions? I think we've got time for probably one more. No? Any comments? Any opportunities to talk about your own thesis for three minutes? <laughs> Don't raise your hand after I say that. <laughs> I'm going to tentatively promote an activist project that I have going. Um, I'm part of a group who are protesting Palantir's practices of data gathering and cooperating with groups like ICE. Um, so if you're interested in helping us pamphlet and spread the word in front of the Palantir offices, maybe come talk to me. So sorry to be that guy. No, 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 no it's a good reason. Yeah. Can I, uh, please. Have the microphone. Yeah. And then I'll give it. So real quick, and I'll give it back, um, but I just want to uh, jump in here before everyone runs off. Um, so we're going to have our lunch break here shortly, and I just wanted to let everyone know that we are going to start uh, very much on time. What is it? Six o'clock sharp. So uh, go ahead out and have fun eating, but uh, I would suggest getting to the Redstone Theater a little bit early to, if you want to see. Okay. So. It's crucial stuff. Um, thanks everyone, can we uh, all give a big round of applause to the panel?